Nothing like having your name in lights, is it? Good to be with you all again this morning. This morning I am looking at something that I think is going to do you well over the next several months, as well as on a day-to-day basis, and that would be prayer. I will admit to you that I struggle in prayer. I don't know if you do or not, but I do. Uh, Sometimes just absolutely finding that moment when I do, although I remember hearing Lori say something about getting a little ding and remembering to pray for something, that's smart, you know, I like that. But sometimes it's, it's that thing of having the moment, having the time to, re- to really sit down and do it. And then at other times, it's that struggle of saying, what's going on here? I- is this really happening? Is this really, for lack of a better term, working the way it's supposed to? I can't tell you how many times that we as a church or me as an individual and I could refer to two or three times in this very church here a few years ago praying for somebody and uh, it didn't happen the way we wanted it to be it just didn't happen and uh, Mikey one of those was Roy as we well remember and I think I remember on that day preaching his funeral and admitting to you that I was a little mad just didn't think it should end that way. So sometimes it's, it's a struggle. And if you don't, then glory to you. But it, it's a struggle sometimes for me. So I want to look at prayer this morning. And um, in particular in Mark chapter 14, if you would like to be turning there. There's a, a book uh, written by Chuck Swindoll. And I have a lot of his books because I, I think he's pretty solid. And the book is called Growing Strong in the Seasons of Life. And in that book, he talks about an incident which happened on an airliner back in 1968 is when the, the story takes place. And the, uh, the plane began its descent for New York. And the pilot realized that the landing gear had refused to engage. And so according to the story that Swindoll tells, he works the controls back and forth, trying again and again to make the gear lock the plane into, or the landing gear into place with no success. He then contacted the control tower for some instructions as he circled the, the landing field. And responding to the crisis, airport personnel you know, came, they sprayed the uh, runway with foam and fire trucks and other emergency vehicles were there on the spot just in case they were needed. Disaster seemed to be just a few minutes away as the plane made its approach. The passengers then were told to, to get in that position, you know, that um, they often tell you about whenever they think things are going to go bad and and pilots uh, announce that stuff with that very calm voice that they seem to always have as they say those things. Flight attendants were moving around the cabin, very cool, and they instructed the passengers, again according to Swindoll's story, to place their heads between their knees to grab their ankles just before the impact. And it was one of those I can't believe this is really happening to me kinds of moments. And people were tearful. Uh, Some were almost to the point of screaming. And it was a fearful thing. The landing was apparently over only a few seconds away when the, the pilot suddenly comes on the intercom and says this. We are beginning our final descent. At this moment, In accordance with international aviation codes established in Geneva, it is my obligation to inform you that if you believe in God, you should commence praying. Now we have some pilots in here. We have some some, uh, instructor pilots and we have some that are training to be pilots. And I'll have to confess to you, I can't find that thing anywhere. It, it, it's not there, this, this statement that the, the pilot read. There, there's nothing that I could find about international aviation codes in Geneva. And if, if, you, if you Google it, 
The only place I think you'll find it is in about 8,000 sermons preached by preachers like me referring to, can you guess, Chuck Swindoll and this particular story. He seems to have been the, the original source for the story. So I, I don't see anything about an international aviation code or anything like that. But I think I may have found where Chuck Swindoll got his story. It goes back to Abby Hoffman. Any of you remember the name Abby Hoffman? Are you old enough to remember that? Oh, please, one or two of you make me feel a little better. Abby Hoffman, 1980, he wrote a book. And that book was entitled, now this is a book entitled, Soon to be a Major Motion Picture. Abby Hoffman, you may remember, and, and he uh, committed suicide in, in 1988, was a notorious social and political activist in the United States, a co-founder of what was then called the Youth International Party, a political party, Youth International Party, YIP, better known as Yippies. Yippies. He was a fugitive from the law who lived under an alias after he was convicted for dealing cocaine. He was a member of what was in, in those days the infamous Chicago 7, one of those that were arrested for violent confrontations with police officers during the 1968 Democratic Convention, which was held in Chicago, Illinois. That Abby Hoffman is the one that I think Chuck Swindoll, the great preacher, is quoting. And Hoffman uses the airplane story that I just mentioned to you to explain this. And I quote Abby Hoffman, and it'll be the last time you probably hear me quote Abby Hoffman, but anyway, there are some things about society that you have absolutely no way of discovering unless you're in a crisis. Church, you're in a crisis right now. You're in a crisis. Now, I don't. Crisis is not necessarily a negative thing. Uh, it, it's that you're at this crossroad where a decision has to be made sometime over the next few weeks or months or whatever it is about calling a new full-time pastor. And if you don't pray about it, you're going to get the wrong one. You're just going to get the wrong one. And, and I don't mean wrong in the sense that, oh, that person shouldn't be here, but wrong in the sense that maybe this is a pretty good fella coming in here, but God's person is right there, and we didn't pray enough to get led to that place, to that person, whatever it is. Now, who should be doing the praying? Pastor Search Committee, right? Who? Everybody? Right. Yeah, everybody should be praying about the new pastor. Everyone should be praying specifically for the pastor search committee to make sure that God's spirit leads them to the person that is the best fit for this church over all. I had an airplane crisis experience one time myself. I had been up in the the Dallas area and had uh, actually been invited there to to preach at the, the cemetery by the way where my parents are, are buried and uh, on the way back Sunday afternoon and I'm on the plane Sunday afternoon Southwest Airlines and back in those days it, it wasn't very crowded you know we could sit one here and one here and have the middle there between you and get good service because there are very few people on the plane so I'm sitting next to the window. I, just, I still like to look out. And so I'm seated next to the window. There's a space, and there's a lady that I've never met before in my life is sitting on the aisle seat there. And we take, take off from Love Field due south, and I'm looking out the window. We're still climbing, and I see the buildings in downtown Dallas as we go by them. And um, we hadn't gone too much farther than that till the pilot comes on and says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain. I've got some good news, and I've got some bad news. Now, you don't want to hear that when you're climbing above downtown Dallas. And I remember going at the lady beside me, and she went at me, and it was almost like we wanted to embrace. 
you know, because this is going to be the last hug I'll ever get in my life, you know, or something, something like, like that. He said, the, the bad news is uh, we don't have radar. Our, our, our radar is out in the, in the plane. This is Southwest, 737. And he said, uh, there's some storms down around the Austin area because that's where I was going to land. And uh, he said, we really don't want to fly into that without a, a radar. He said, the good news is we're going to turn this baby around, set it right back down. You're going to change to another plane. You'll be on your way. And that's exactly what happened. Probably 15 or 20 minutes maybe that, uh, that went by. And, uh, but it was one of those things. And looking at that other lady, it was like I didn't know her, but I was so ready to hold her hand. This thing just keeps falling off. I guess I need to get my ear fixed, don't I? Cover my ear. But uh, it, it, it was so close. And, and it was, I think, goes back to what Abby Hoffman is saying. There was a crisis. And I was finding out that I wanted comfort. And I didn't have anybody around but this woman sitting beside me over here. And I think she must have felt the same way. Jesus one time cried out to his father. And the way Mark uses the verb, I asked you about Mark 14 a moment ago, chapter 36. The way Mark uses the verb, it's what is called in the, in the original languages an imperfect tense, which basically refers to a past event that is continually going on. It's almost like a present tense, but it's referring to, to the past. And uh, Mark 14, 36, in particular, uh, Jesus is saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. And the cup being his pending death, his passion. And yet not what I will, but what you will. And when he makes this statement, he is facing kind of like I was that day, a life-threatening crisis. In those moments before his own death, before his crucifixion, Jesus was drawn to that which, like most of us, at least most of us in this room, provides the most comfort. And there, there are two sources here that I'm talking about. One is his closest friends. You know, when, when you're in a crisis, um, one of the things that is comforting to you are your friends, your, your family. Um, hey, guys up in the booth, can I just take this off? I think it's fallen and people keep laughing at me, so I'm just going to... They're looking at me. That's not the reason you're laughing? Okay, sorry. I, I, I've got other... Never mind. Okay, now. They're still laughing. Never mind. So he wanted his closest friends, and they're identified there a few verses before that, Mark 14, 33, as Peter, James, and John. We like to have our close friends around us when we're in trouble, family, those kinds of folks. And the other thing that he was drawn to during the crisis was something that I just mentioned to you a moment ago, and that is prayer, of coming to the Lord and saying, what do I need to do? And in verse 35, uh, Jesus tells these three men to stay alert, and they did, right? Nah. But Jesus, according to verse 35, fell to the ground and prayed. Now again, like I said a moment ago about a, a good brother in Christ like uh, Roy, um, sometimes the prayers don't get answered the way we want to. Jesus prayed specifically that this cup might pass, meaning I can avoid the crucifixion somehow. I, I don't understand that. But he went to the cross anyway. He was sent to the cross. He died anyway. There would be no way of escape. The issue was, and, and is for us, will we be obedient in the process? Will we be obedient from this point on? And Mikey, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on Roy one more time. He was obedient. To the end, he was obedient and filled with faith. And so was Mikey. That's how we have to be, even when the answer is not what we want it to be. And in this particular instance, that's what's going on with Jesus. In the moments of his deepest grief, when he's feeling almost overwhelmed by the, the, the crisis, he's praying that somehow it might 
pass. And, and I, the, the English translations that, that we read fail to do justice to Jesus' emotional state of mind. About the closest one that comes to that is a version that I, I kind of like as well. Matter of fact, beautiful Jenny there inter, uh, introduced me to it called the New Living Translation. And if you looked at the New Living Translation, the NLT, of chapter 14, verse 33, it says this. He began to be filled, talking about Jesus, he began to be filled with horror and deep distress. This is Christ we're talking about. The, the one who could have called the angels and stopped the whole thing. His humanity is fearful. It's a, it's a fearful thing. Horror and deep crisis. And so you, you think Jesus went to the, to the uh, uh, cross with this kind of... Uh, I think it's the, the Stoics, right, that have this, I'll just go to the cross, it's not going to bother me. No, that's not the way he went. If, if anything, that's a, a movie of, of Jesus or something that we make up. But as the cross, the cross grew closer, that's hard to say, cross grew closer, guess who else grew closer? The Father. As he got closer and closer to the cross, he got closer and closer to the Father. And so in this constant cry, this persistent prayer, Jesus is strengthened. And he is strengthened by Abba, Father. You probably know that Abba is an Aramaic word, which essentially means daddy. Dada, almost, if we want to put it in, in those terms. Uh, Papa, perhaps. There's, there's no evidence that we can find in, in the text here that the Jews ever used that word in addressing uh, God the Father, or, or God, I'll just put it that way. There, there's, no, there's no evidence that they did. As a matter of fact, if you see people today who are Jewish or who claim to be Messianic Jewish, when they write God, do you know what they, how they write it? G-D. Because they don't even want to write that name let alone come to Almighty God and say, Hey, Dad, they don't want to do that. That's too irres uh, irreverent and showing no respect. But Jesus, the Son, walks right up to him and says, Daddy. That's an important thing for us to keep in our minds here. Using such a familial term, a, a family term, discloses something very important, and that is the intimate relationship that Jesus had with his father. And you're going, well, of course, he's his son. Yes, but he's close. I know sons and fathers who don't have close relationships like that, and you do too. In this particular instance, Jesus was the son, but he also had a very daddy-like relationship with him in the private context and now evidently in a public context. But Jesus is assuring us as well that that kind of relationship is not his alone. It belongs to us as well. You know why? We are God's children. We are his sons and daughters. Not, not just by creation, but by the new creation. The, the redemptive process that God has carried out in our lives. That is why often you hear people who, be, and I confess I didn't remember hearing that a moment ago, but it may have just been me when, when Frank came to pray. A lot of people will begin their prayers with saying, Our Father, right? Our Father. I, I, I do. I guess I'm 99% of the time. I'll begin by saying Father or Lord. That's because I belong to him. And he belongs to, to me. He is my father. There is no sweeter sense of intimacy than to belong. There is no grander sense of intimacy than to belong to the father in heaven. Abba, father. The greatest of Jesus' followers, a missionary and church planter of no parallel, is named Paul. Paul took that concept that Jesus prayed, this Abba concept, and he took it and, and in a sense, reinterpreted it, although I think a, a better understanding is fully interpreted it for subsequent generations of, of Christ's followers. Other than that one appearance in Mark 14 that we read just a moment ago, there are two other places in the New Testament where Abba appears. Both of them are in the writings of the Apostle Paul. 
Turn with me to Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Galatians 4, verse 6. Paul writes, Because you are sons, and if Paul were writing today, he'd be forced to be politically correct, and he would say, Because you are sons and daughters, ladies, we are not in, uh, excluding you. Because you are, let's just say, children, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. Remember Jesus said that? Now that spirit is in our hearts crying, what? Abba, Father. Romans 8.15 is the other. Romans 8.15. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a, and this is key, spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Notice in both of these verses, there is an activity that's associated with it that is extremely important. And that is the activity of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, it is the Spirit of His Son that even enables us to say, Abba, Father. We wouldn't be able to say that if we didn't belong to him. In Romans 8, 15, the second text I, I read, albeit a little bit less directly, we're assured that we have a spirit of adoption as sons. And it's that spirit of adoption that enables us to cry, Abba, Father. Same intimate language, same Heavenly Father, same result. The cry known as prayer. Now, that which Paul reinterpreted, or again, fully interpreted, if, if you please, has to do with Paul's emphasis on the father's children, sons is the word he uses, but his, his children, through adoption. Adoption. Now, that's, that's an interesting term, and probably one of my favorite terms for uh, redemption in all of the New Testament. By the way, you, you, can, you can talk about that in a hundred different words, it seems like. You can say redeemed, saved, converted, um, uh, adopted. There, there are a lot of reconciled. There are a lot of different terms. Some of them get a, give a little bit different shade, but for the most part, it means what we Baptists would typically say saved to, to the Lord. Although saved typically in Texas has two syllables. Right? Saved. Two, two syllables. You have to say it that way or people don't know. I, anyway, so if we look back at John 3.16 that says that, that Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Father, then the rest of us are adopted. We're, that's all we are. We're, we're adoptees. Now here's a question. Is it possible to have real authority authentic parental closeness if you're adopted. Now, I, I'm a natural born to my mom and dad, and so uh, it was quite natural for me to have a good, close relationship with me because they were my mom and dad. But what if I had been adopted and I had no idea where my parents were or if they were even alive or where they lived or looked like or anything else? Is it possible for me or anyone else to have that kind of closeness with an adopted mo mother and father? Is it possible? Well, in a report at the American Adoption Congress that met in Orlando back in 88 or uh, 98, there was an unidentified speaker who said this. There are days when relinquished, and that's the term basically meaning giving up for adoption, relinquished and adopted people walk alone without the rhythm and beat of a marching army. We all, adopted and non-adopted alike, avoid deep connections. Now listen to this, avoid deep connections if we have trouble with trust. Key term, trust. And so we come back to that question again. Can you, can you get close to an adopted parent? And, and we, you know where this is going. We better be able to say yes at, at that point. According to the speaker, 
that I read there a moment ago, whoever that was, it's possible, but one of the key components is trust. You have to trust your adopted parent to do the right thing for you, just like you hopefully would if it were a natural parent. In any church congregation, any church congregation, and I've seen it in every one I've been a part of, there are people who have issues with trust on, on several levels. Um, maybe you've seen what it's like to have trust crumble right before your eyes because somebody let you down. I mean, I, I have. Jenny and I have a really good friend that has experienced that on at least two, at least two occasions with churches. And he has a trust issue with churches, not with God, although I struggle sometimes with that. Not with God, he says, but with churches. And if that's the case, if, if you've been let down like that, then you uh, naturally are going to have some trouble uh, with trusting other people because you're afraid I'll get let down the same way too. Uh, I've known people who have been in marital relationships that have been broken because of, of uh, trust issues, intimacy issues uh, with someone else, and it's hard to want to remarry because I don't want this to happen to me a second time. And so it's essentially the, the trust issues again. That's reasonable. But when Paul comes back and says in Scripture that we have received a spirit of adoption, as he said in Romans 8.15, he is addressing not only the highest, but the absolute surest and safest kind of trust that there is. You're talking about trusting God. Now, is God trustworthy? Can you trust God? To do what he says he's going to do. Of course, I, I expect that in here. Mm -hmm. But when you're alone by yourself and you're talking to the Lord, is it the same? Is it the same? Here's some good news for you. When Paul uses that term adoption, he uses it in the context of a a Roman occupation. The Romans, of course, have moved in. They've taken over the Holy Land. They're in charge. And so it's not just a Roman occupation, but it's a Roman society and a Roman culture that is being basically imposed upon the people there of what we would call uh, Israel. Roman adoption carried with it three distinct privileges. These are so important. Number one, Adoption carried with it a change in status. A change in status. Under Roman law, adopted children or, or slaves even that had been brought into the family became sons and daughters. They're real sons. Their, their status was changed. Secondly, all debts from the adopted child or the adopted slave's past were canceled. And so whenever uh, a, a slave was, was adopted or another person was adopted, if they owed 2,000 drachma to somebody, that debt was settled. It's over. It's done. They owe nothing else. You get in the picture? And the third one, and my favorite one, an adopted son could never be disowned. Oh, let that sink in. An adopted son could never be disowned. A Roman father could disown his own natural born son, but if he adopted somebody, that son could not be disowned. Wow. Wow. And so when you apply that to us, it says this, our status has changed. We are legitimate children of the heavenly father number two our debts have been canceled that is to say our sins have been forgiven through christ on his cross and third the father will never reject us never ever 
reject us. What does that say, my Baptist brothers and sisters, for the eternal salvation that we all argue for so clearly? It says we're secure if we know the Lord. Never can we be rejected. And so the security that we have as Christians has a big part of making certain that when we pray to the Lord, he is trustworthy and that we can draw close to him, intimate with him, and to say to him, as most Jewish people would never say, and probably most people, in, in, even Christians would never say, Dad, wow, that is a powerful statement. It is still a, a much quoted, although uh, I, I came to find out misappropriated line. Do you, do you remember the, the famous line that goes something like this? The mass of men lead uh, lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. I say it's misappropriated because it's often appropriated to Thoreau. And, and I think that's not correct. Well, even at that, though, the lines may be true for some people, maybe even uh, several people. But for those of whom it is true, it's a bitter fact. If you go to the grave with the song still in you, you haven't ever sung it to the Father. Because he's close and he will listen even to somebody as awful as I am in singing. Probably the, the praise team is looking down. So I said, whoa, why didn't Craver ever sing? You don't want to hear me sing. You know, I've, I've often said that whenever I was, uh, thought I was being called to uh, ministry, never, ever, ever once did I say, and Lord, is it music? Mm -mm. Wasn't going to happen. And so in quiet ignorance people who have neglected that relationship with the father will often ask the same questions as another adoptee that I found this one named her name is Audrey Audrey said this who am I where am I from who was my dad who was my mom was I the first or was I the last where was my beginning where was my past the emptiness that grows inside, the knowing secret I always hide, the knowing question that people ask, who are you and what was your past? Well, I don't know all of you. Since I was here several years ago, we've had a few additions. And even then, I don't know everybody's past. You don't know my past. But guess what? We all have one. We all have a past. More importantly than what your past was is the question, who are you today? Or even better, whose are you today? And so my prayer and my hope is that uh, more than anything else, you have been adopted into the Father's family, that you belong to him, and that you can come, and maybe it took this message today on that adoption thing to convince you that the Lord's not going to get rid of you. <laughs> you know, he's not going to get rid of you. He's not going to say, okay, I have had enough of you. No, he's not going to do it. You can get close and you can say, Father, you have not received a spirit of adoption leading to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption by which we call out Abba. Father. And over the next few weeks and months, the challenge that I will leave you with is to pray diligently for that pastor search committee. Pray diligently for that search committee. Pray diligently for whoever the Lord may have out there. We're, we're often uh, good to say, and, and uh, you know, the Lord knows who that is. He's already preparing that person. Well, yeah, I, I'm with you on that one. Pray for that person then. Give that person a name. Call that person pastor. And pray for that person and that person's family. Because probably that person is going to be bringing a wife and some children. Um, you would want the wife to be willing to come to Del Rio, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you want the children to say, hey, we're excited about that. That sounds good. 
You know, you, you want that in your next pastor. So pray for that whole family, whoever that might be and wherever they might be. But pray for yourself. Pray for the pastor search committee. Get close to God and say, Abba, Father, we come to you praying for our church and our next pastor. Join me, please, in a, a season and a spirit of prayer. Father, we uh, know that there is much to be done here. And none of it can be done unless you are intervening in ways that we have never even considered perhaps at this time. And I do pray for this church. I love this church and all the good people that are in it. And I pray that you would give leadership to all that are in leadership positions, your spirit, you would, you would give an extra measure of that to deacons and Sunday school teachers, committee members, and especially those who comprise the pastor search committee, that you would unify them, that you would give them an ability to sense exactly where they should go based upon the wishes of the congregation, and the congregation has prayerfully considered as well so that there's a unity there, not a d division, but that you are bringing all parties together. And we pray, Lord, that you would give that kind of a vision and leadership beginning right this very second. And so whoever this new pastor is and wherever he might be, we ask that you would begin to uh, work within his mind and heart, his family members, that they might also be fully uh, cognizant of your work in their lives and, and particularly if you have called them to a new church field. Father, I pray for a divine fit between that person and this church, that it might be a long lasting, comfortable relationship. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.